From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome now to Balance of Power. Well, President Biden has now returned from the Middle East, where he went over to cover a number of subjects, one of which, of course, was oil and the possibility of getting more oil out of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's not clear exactly what he got for that ask, uh, but it, it, we did have an opportunity to talk with the Minister of Investment for the Kingdom, Khalid Afali, earlier. And exclusively, this is what he said about the Kingdom providing more oil. The spare capacity, of course, is designed to be spared from the average production. The kingdom has responded to crisis situations, COVID, decline in production because of policies in the United States, decline in production in other countries because of sanctions. So our spare capacity has come to the market, significant amounts of it, uh, to, to save the market from uh, situations that perhaps we could not have uh, predicted. Uh, and of course, when we do, the remaining spare capacity is less than uh, when, when we started compared to the steady state production uh, profile that we had drawn for ourselves. Uh, the other thing I would mention is His Royal Highness has, uh, uh, the Crown Prince has announced and has directed uh, an action has already taken place for the kingdom to raise its uh, sustainable capacity to 13 million barrels, which is a significant number that, uh, that, that I had not forecasted when I was Minister of Energy. So I think the, le the leadership of Saudi Arabia today have already taken extraordinary action by the kingdom. And you can count on the kingdom on fulfilling its commitment. When the kingdom says we're going to raise our production capacity to 13, you will see the kingdom raising its capacity to 13 and producing 13 when the market calls for it. That was Khalid Al-Fali. He is Saudi Arabia's Minister of Investment. And now we turn to one of the most experienced and accomplished diplomats whom we have. He's John Negroponte. He's vice chairman of McLarty Associates now. He's the former deputy secretary of state and director of national intelligence, as well as U.S. ambassador to the United Nations and several countries, including Iraq and Mexico, among others. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, give us your sense as, a, as such a seasoned diplomat. What do you believe was accomplished by President Biden's trip to the Middle East? Well, I think it was a very important trip. Uh, of course, uh, Israel was one of the highlights, and that's uh, obviously a cornerstone of United States policy uh, towards the Middle East. So he uh, definitely uh, checked that box. He went to uh, Ramallah in the Palestinian territories to uh, show that he still uh, remains uh, committed. However, long term and however vaguely to the idea of a Palestinian state, although he said that the that the, the chances for uh, short term progress were uh, not that great. Uh, and then, of course, he went to uh, Saudi Arabia. I would note in passing that he's the first president in 20 years not to go to Iraq as president. And uh, I think that omission in and of itself is noteworthy and tells me that uh, Iraq is no longer a front burner issue in United States foreign policy. And by the way, it's not doing too badly at the moment. So uh, I thought that was very interesting. But as far as the visit to Saudi, I think certainly uh, there's going to be something on oil. The, the minister's uh, remarks that you just played uh, tell me that we're going to have to wait and see. There's apparently a meeting at the ministerial level on the 3rd of August where some of these things might be decided. But I would expect that uh, production and exports are going to be bumped up uh, somewhat by Saudi Arabia. Certainly, he alludes to the increase in capacity, which creates the possibility uh, for uh, more exports. So uh, that, that would be my guesstimate on that, although we cannot be absolutely certain. And then the other point I'd make besides uh, whatever might have been accomplished on oil, which we'll have to wait and see, is that I think this was a very strategic trip by the president. Uh, he's sending a message that the Gulf states and the Gulf Cooperation Council and the other countries he met with, uh, 
uh, Egypt, Jordan, and Iraq, the leaders of those countries, are important to the United States, particularly in this new era or renewed era, if you will, of uh, uh, competition uh, between the great powers, especially China and Russia. So uh, overall, I think it was a very timely and strategic uh, and important trip. So, so Mr. Ambassador, spend a moment, if you would, on that great competition you just described. You mentioned Russia and China. Take Russia first. We also have Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, about to visit Tehran this week. Uh, how much of what the President Biden did over there was really directed specifically at Iran? Well, there you go. I mean, I think uh, certainly a, a fair amount. And uh, what certainly caught my attention, and I, you know, I don't, I read what I read in the papers, and I talk to a few people, but I don't have the access to the information that the administration has, obviously. But when I read that uh, that they're going to, the Russians are going to be talking to Iran about buying uh, Iranian drones, I said, wow. Uh, you know, that's a significant development. The, look at all the fuss we made about the possibility that China might sell military equipment to Russia. And here Iran is uh, talking to them about g giving them drones. So that, I think, really accentuated this geopolitical aspect of the situation. Uh, talk to us a moment, if you would, Mr. Ambassador, about Ukraine and Russia specifically. It's such a large issue looming in the geopolitical landscape right now. There's talk about possibly some arrangement to get grain out of the Black Sea. What do you make of that? I, I saw that that discussion has been going on, and uh, the last I uh, looked into it, uh, Russia hadn't made up its mind yet whether it would go along with some kind of arrangement that would allow both Russian and Ukrainian grain uh, to be exported uh, from the Black Sea area, and that that would depend on the final decision of Mr. Putin. So I guess all eyes on him as far as that is concerned. But if it were to happen, I think that that would be a very positive development. At, at the same time, obviously, we have a lot of sanctions on Russia. Uh, we mean NATO, the United States, other Western allies. Uh, but Russia really is threatening the natural gas situation with Western Europe, which could particularly hurt, hurt Germany. Can we hold the coalition together as this gets more and more difficult? Yeah. Well, that's uh, like a $64,000 question. Uh, how do we know, you know, as the winter, as the autumn and the winter approaches and uh, the potential of these kinds of pressures, especially if gas gets cut off for one reason or another, uh, a tough decision. But up until now, let's be honest, the, uh, the uh, NATO alliance and the European Union and ourselves, we've held pretty well together on this. And uh, I think we've got to credit both the administration and the Europeans for having done that. It's been uh, quite amazing. Nothing short of amazing, really as to how well they've worked together, and the NATO expansion issue, which we, you and I have talked about before. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I want to come back to that great competition you mentioned involving Russia, and particularly China, as you mentioned. And we talked about the Middle East. It's not just happening there, it appears. It's also happening in Latin America. It's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's happening in the South Pacific. Uh, how is America, the United States, positioning itself to compete with, with China? Because clearly our, our emissaries are out there all the time now, visiting some of the same people and in the same places in competition with one another. Yeah, well, in the South Pacific, uh, I see we've stepped up our game. Uh, we had a fisheries agreement with them, which my office, by the way, 30 years ago, back 1987, I think, uh, when I ran the Bureau of Oceans, Environment, and Science, uh, negotiated with the South Pacific countries, and they're talking about improving on that now and expanding it in terms of the amount of money involved and everything. So I think we're going to try there. Uh, Kurt Campbell, the, uh, the the czar for the Indo-Pacific in the National Security Council, he went out to the Solomon Islands. I think that was important. Uh, where I see uh, some weakness and 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 have a particular concern is in Latin America because things uh, are definitely not improving from a political point of view in that that part of the world. You have Venezuela. You have Colombia now that's elected. Uh, a, a communist uh, leader. You've got Nicaragua, which is uh, kind of a shambles. And you have the problems with uh, the Northern Triangle uh, that we face with regard to immigration and corruption and so forth. So I think we really got to step up our game in Latin America as well, because uh, 
both Russia and China uh, are interested in that part of the world. So let me just pursue that one point, because you were ambassador of Mexico as well as Honduras. I know you know that part of the world very well. When you say step up the game, what is that? Is that money? Is that aid? What is it? Well, it's a combination of things. It's uh, certainly uh, some aid. It's trade arrangements uh, where we don't have them or bolstering them, uh, getting them in better shape. It's perhaps uh, not lecturing quite so much on human rights. Uh, human rights has to play a role in our relationships, no question about it. But uh, you don't have to make it uh, the foremost issue when you talk to these countries. I like to say that if you lecture these people too much, someday the lecture room is going to be empty. So I think we've got to take human rights and put it in better perspective. It's only one part of a relationship and not the whole thing. But sometimes I fear that we kind of act as if human rights is everything. Now, if you take the signal from Mr. Biden's trip to Saudi Arabia, there I think he's putting the overall relationship in perspective and not just holding up human rights as the single litmus test of our relationship with that country. I think we got to take more of that kind of approach with some of these other countries around the world. Okay, thank you so much. It's always such a pleasure and so beneficial to talk to you. That's John Negropani. He's vice chairman of McClarty Associates, an esteemed ambassador for the United States. Coming up, we're going to talk with Dr. Asha Shah of Stanford Health about the BA5 variant of COVID and how concerned we all should be. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Mark Crumpton here with the first word. David, thank you. Sanctions against Russia are causing, quote, colossal challenges for the country's technology. But President Vladimir Putin told officials today he won't simply give up or allow the nation's economy to fall back by decades. President Putin says instead Moscow will, quote, intensively seeks solutions by relying on its own resources and its domestic innovative companies. The European Union's foreign policy chief is sounding an optimistic tone that Moscow and Kyiv can make a deal to help export grain from Ukraine and avert a global food crisis. Josip Borrell spoke to reporters ahead of an EU Foreign Affairs Council meeting in Brussels. I hope, and I think I have a hope, that uh, this week it will be possible to reach an agreement to the block Odessa and other Ukrainian ports. The life of thousands, more than thousands, tens of thousands of people depends on this agreement. So it's not a diplomatic game. It's some issue of life and death. Borrell's comments came a day before Turkish President Recep Erdogan meets President Putin to talk about moving Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea. Longtime Trump advisor Steve Bannon goes on trial today. He's facing criminal contempt charges relating to the congressional probe of the January 6th Capitol riot. Bannon has spent months trying to get his case dismissed or delayed, saying charging him for failing to cooperate with the investigation would be, quote, the misdemeanor from hell for top Democrats. If convicted, Bannon would face jail time and fines. The nation's top infectious disease expert is making plans to retire. Dr. Anthony Fauci tells Politico he'll leave by the time President Biden's term ends. Dr. Fauci also says he's ready for any political attacks if Republicans take control of the House or Senate, but says that's not a factor in his retirement decision. He's served under seven presidents. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David?
Thank you so much, Mark. Well, given what's happened with the pandemic, when we talk about Dr. Fauci, we necessarily think about COVID. And COVID, as much as we would like it to go away, is still very much with us, particularly in this new BA5 variant that seems to be spreading around the country. To bring us up to speed on exactly where we are today, we turn now to Dr. Asha Shah. She is Stanford Health Director of Infectious Diseases. Doctor, thank you so much for being back with us. What are you seeing up there at Stanford with respect to BA5? So we are seeing COVID cases rise again. Um, our percent positivity is going up. Um, the hospitalizations are going up, but ever so slightly. So again, it's nice to see that most of the disease is spreading within the community, but not causing that severity of disease that we used to see back in 2020 and 2021. We have seen some reports that this variant or subvariant, I guess it is really, of Omicron uh, is more resistant to immunity. Do you see evidence of that? Yes, we are seeing people get reinfected. Um, and what we've seen from data from South Africa where this subvariant was identified um, is that it can outsmart uh, the immunity provided by vaccines um, as well as natural immunity uh, particularly in individuals who had the original Omicron variant, which was BA1, back in December and January. Uh, doctor, what about the demographics, as it were? Does it affect disproportionately the elderly as opposed to young people? Are you seeing in young people as well as elderly? And is it particularly uh, difficult for the immunocompromised? Yeah, so as we've seen all along with COVID, um, it is affecting all demographics. Uh, we are seeing a lot of travel related COVID now as folks are getting uh, back to vacationing, especially with summer, uh, being in crowded airport terminals um, and unfortunately coming home with COVID. Um, so it's affecting the young and the old, but we know that the elderly population as well as those that are immunocompromised are at more risk from severe disease from COVID, mm. which is why it's even more important for those folks to be up to date with their vaccinations. Should we be bracing for a big wave this winter? So we are preparing uh, for a, a wave or a surge or a swell or however it wants to be termed of COVID, um, but also other respiratory illnesses. We used to see waves of influenza every winter um, before um, COVID came into play. And so that is something that I think we should all expect to see coming this winter. But what's nice this time is that, again, we have the tools to fight these infections and to protect ourselves from these infections like vaccines and masks, et cetera. So, Doctor, you'd think that COVID should be enough for us, but now we have this monkeypox. Uh, I know we have it in New York City. Are you finding it in your practice? Yes, we are starting to see some cases of monkeypox here in Connecticut, um, as well as here in Stanford. Um, and it's a situation that we've been preparing for for the past couple of months as we've seen kind of this outbreak unfold across the country. And uh, tell us about it. I mean, what is the treatment for it? I mean, is there a vaccine? What does one do? So monkeypox is a viral infection um, that is uh, disproportionately affecting uh, the community of men who have sex with men. Um, it's predominantly all the cases that we are seeing are in males. Um, and it's a viral infection that's um, marked by fever and a characteristic rash. Many times the infection will get better on its own, but there are treatments available through the federal stockpile for individuals who do have severe disease. Um, there is vaccine available, but not enough. Um, and so vaccine has been released from the federal government to areas of the country that are experiencing high transmission of monkeypox. But I do think we need more vaccine um, to protect uh, these high-risk communities from acquiring monkeypox um, and, and keeping them as protected as possible. Doctor, thank you so very much for being with us. Really appreciate this. Dr. Asha Shah, she is Stanford Health Director of Infectious Diseases. Still to come, we're going to talk with the Dean of American Bank Regulation, Raj Cohen of Sullivan and Cromwell, about the state of the U.S. banking system. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Burning.
earnings season is here. Buzzwords this earnings season, recession, inflation, foreign exchange, layoffs. We are starting to see, well, the world get a little bit more cautious about what these earnings are going to look like. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. Second quarter earnings at Delta Airlines missed expectations. When that inflation print hit, my eyes were on Amazon in particular. With exclusive expert analysis. The issue here really is elevated cost. If you take a look at the projections, that is the story. Bloomberg Television and Radio, the fastest numbers and analysis you trust. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There's a lot going on in Washington, and some of it may actually even be affecting the markets. So to get a sense of the markets overall, and specifically how Washington may be affecting them, we turn now to Kriti Gupta. So first of all, markets overall. I see a lot of green here when I look at my equity indices. A lot of green on the screen. And this is interesting because it's coming on your second straight day of gains. Now, remember Friday, we did end up on a positive note. So to see this continue is pretty important, especially when you have those kind of uh, momentous gains of Friday. Usually when you look at that gains by those margins, you do see like a reversal the next day. We aren't seeing that. In fact, one of the drivers underneath the hood is that CHIPS rally is coming off of a uh, potential a bill that may get passed in Congress, I believe, by next week um, for House spending. And this on, on specifically CHIPS, what it also does is limit spending for a lot of these CHIP companies in China, saying that if you have, for example, um, and any kind of legacy chip business in, in China right now, what we're going to do is you will give you assistance from the U.S. government, but in return, you can't expand on that investing there. Essentially, this is President Biden's way, or I should say the U.S. government's way of saying, invest right here at home and we'll give you the grants to do it. And so therefore, you see a lot of the companies that have that U.S. exposure, NVIDIA, Intel, et cetera, actually gain. And people have been talking about it up on Capitol for a good long time. There's a lot of things, other things going on, but now it looks like they might actually get something done. We'll find out that's true or not. But it turns out one of the issues is, Competition, competition with China, certainly for supporters, but even with Europe, because Europe is now pointing up some real money here. The United States hasn't done as well at that. It hasn't done as well as that. And this is a big part of the problem in that a lot of the uh, facilities or a lot of the kind of capacity to actually make some of these chips, well, it has been outsourced because at the end of the day, it does cost far, far more to build it onto U.S. soil. But here's the problem. In doing that, when you actually make that transition back from, from chip making in, say, Taiwan, for example, to, say, Arizona or New Mexico, where Intel, for example, is trying to build their plans, that process gets more expensive as well. And right now, that kind of nearshoring isn't really that desirable at the moment for a lot of these companies who are saying, well, we're just trying to tread water at the moment. And that's where I think more companies like in Europe, for example, come in handy. For example, um, Semiconductor Saxony has been a major joke about simply semi production in Germany of all places. But even if we do get this bill passed and the president signs it, which I'm sure he will, it takes a while to get these things built. It does take a while to get these things built, but from a marketing and from a uh, stock market perspective, that funding, that assistance, that immediately shows up in, in, in the fundamentals. And that's why you're seeing that rally today. Fascinating. And how's the dollar doing? The dollar's weaker, which is another reason you're wow. seeing that rally. Taking a little bit of a breather. Is that going to continue? Who knows? Yeah, everybody's nervous about that dollar. Thank you so much, Kriti. Really great to have you with us always. That's Kriti Gupta, and you can catch Kriti again at 1 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Markets, where she will be anchoring. Coming up, the major banks have reported their earnings. We're going to talk about what they say about the industry overall with Raj Cohen. He's senior chairman of Sullivan and Cromwell. One of the issues is whether those reserves being required by the Fed are getting in the way of lending money. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and to keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Mark Crumpton, who is here with the first word. Mark? David, thank you. Ukrainian authorities are pledging to clean up law enforcement agencies after President Volodymyr Zelensky removed the nation's security chief and suspended its top prosecutor. The head of the state security service was fired amid questions over how Russian forces managed to take the southern region of Kherson. Ukraine says it continues to identify people who, quote, work for the enemy and, again, quoting, who leak information to the enemy. In the UK, Labour Party leader Keir Starmer is blasting the Conservative Party's economic agenda. This comes as the Tories are in the process of picking a leader to replace Boris Johnson. Starmer spoke with Bloomberg's Emily Ashton. 
had 12 years of failure, and I think that uh, any sense that the Conservative Party is the party of the economy has just been blown out the water. And if you look at the leadership race that's going on at the moment, you've got absolute fantasy economics going on. The hundreds of billions of pounds of unfunded uh, spending commitments. So there's no way the Conservatives can claim that they're the party of economics anymore. Starmer says his Labour Party would reboot the UK economy to boost growth. The UK is bracing for a heat wave this week. Temperatures in London and the south of England might hit a record setting 40 degrees Celsius. That's 104 degrees Fahrenheit. All of the UK's 10 warmest years have occurred since 2002. And record breaking heat is set to scorch the central United States for another week and threaten Texas with searing temperatures. Forecasts say it could hit 110 degrees in Fort Worth today and tomorrow and 109 degrees in Dallas. The state's main grid operator is predicting record energy demand this week as Texans crank up air conditioners to cool down. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crump, and this is Bloomberg. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, the, the, we had bank earnings out from Bank of America as well as Goldman Sachs today, really completing the big bank reporting because we had others last week. To take us through exactly what we're learning from these earnings about the strength of the banking system overall, we turn now to Raj Cohen. He is senior chairman at Sullivan Cromwell and really the dean of American bank regulation. I say that every time because it's just true. So, Raj, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it. One thing I thought we might focus on is the capital requirements for the banks because this has come up in, I think, every Every earnings report, certainly Jamie Dimon last week said, look, at it's really getting in the way of our lending as much money as we might. Are the capital requirements starting to affect the bank's ability to lend? Well, David, first of all, pleasure as always to be here with you. And I uh, think we are at the margin now where additional capital requirements would adversely affect a uh, bank's ability to lend. There is conversation about where capital requirements should be going. Uh, beyond, though, the overall uh, issue of how is capital affecting lending, certainly the regulatory approach to certain areas of lending, uh, such as commercial real estate, are starting to pinch on the ability of banks to engage in that lending. One of the things we've seen, Raj, so far, we saw it in Bank of America today, is some losses in some of the leveraged loans that have been given. But you don't see losses in consumers. Uh, are banks taking bigger risks when it comes to some of the companies with leveraged loans they are with consumers? I actually don't think so. Uh, leverage, by definition, is going to be highly influenced by interest rates. And, of course, interest rates have soared. So one would expect uh, to see higher losses in leverage lending. And I think that's throughout the industry. It's not uh, B of A specific. On the consumer, there ultimately will be an impact of uh, inflation. It's not this quarter because consumers still have so much cash uh, from all the government programs and uh, from the uh, inability really to spend it, but that margin is running out. And leverage also uh, is a, a really a factor for many consumers, those who have to spend most of their paycheck on necessities, inflation really leverages them in a very adverse way. Roger, we're in the process of getting a new regulator, if I can put it that way, the vice chair for supervision of the Federal Reserve, Michael Barr. Uh, and you know him, you know his background. What do we expect him to face and what do we expect him to do for that matter? Well, Michael Barr, I think, is a superb choice uh, for that position. He comes with a mastery of what is really an extraordinarily complex regulatory system which may be uh, unsurpassed. Uh, and that knowledge and that confidence that he has in his ability, I think he will be a real leader. Clearly, he's going to focus on the consumer. Much of his writing has been about that. 
and I will see a focus there. But there are also a number of unfinished Federal Reserve uh, prospects and projects, uh, which include Basel IV capital requirements. To come back to your original uh, question, David, uh, uh, there is the so-called alphabet set of Federal Reserve regulations, which have not been really dealt with for a number of years, and then cryptocurrency. Well, and then cryptocurrency. I'm glad you put that at the end because I was going to ask you about it. We've talked about it several times here. What is going on with regulation of cryptocurrency? And it's not just the Fed, of course. We've got the SEC, CFTC. Why is it taking so long, Raj? I think it's taking so long primarily because it is a difficult subject. But I really believe it is disappointing that the recent collapse of a number of cryptocurrencies and related companies has not created more of a sense of urgency. Uh, we don't want to be here in a year or two years when somebody said, well, yeah, cryptocurrencies collapsed in 2022, and it really didn't affect the overall financial system. So how could we ever have known? And this last time, real people lost a lot of real money. So this is not just video games. This, this is reality. Uh, and. Uh, when you look at what I regard as the truly responsible players in this space among cryptocurrency uh, originators, they do not flinch from regulation. They see regulation as an opportunity rather than an obstacle. But one of the things that strikes me, Raj, is as far as I can tell, this is not particularly a partisan issue. I hear Republicans and Democrats saying we should have regulation. I hear the regulators saying we should regulate. It doesn't get done. Is the problem that there are just too many cooks in this kitchen? I think that is really a, a very perceptive point. There are a lot of cooks and a lot of ideas. And for me, the uh, ability to regulate is exists with FSOC. Uh, FSOC can look prospectively to the future, and uh, that would bring everybody together, at least in terms of the administrative agencies. So, Raj, finally, right in your backyard, this is what you do. Talk to us about bank mergers, because you pointed this out to me, that they've trailed way off. Is that a regulatory problem? I, I can hear a lot of people saying it's because there's too many regulations, or is it something else? Um, First of all, you are so right that uh, they have trailed off. I think one critically interesting statistic is that the largest bank deal done in the second quarter was only the 29th largest in the last six quarters. Hmm. Uh, but I think the real factor, the most important factor, is economic uncertainty. Buyers don't like to buy, and sellers are less interested in selling when there is uncertainty. Uh, banks can deal with a weak economy or a strong economy, but what they can't deal with in merger talks is uncertainty. Well, we have a lot of that without a doubt. Raj, it's always such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. That's Raj Cohen. He's senior chairman at Sullivan and Cromwell. Coming up, it's time for our midterm report uh, with contributors Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It is Monday, which means that it is time for Midterms 2022. That's our weekly report on the midterm elections coming up in under four months now. And we're joined once again with our political contr political contributors, Ricky, Rick, Ricky, Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College. I get the two of you confused. It's like Mutt and Jeff. <laughs> so, Rick, let's start with you. Maryland is the big one up this week, right? And uh, I was looking at it. It looked like the governor's race is the most interesting one. Yeah, for sure. The successor to Hogan will be uh, really probably identified in this uh, uh, primary. And the, really, the eyes are on the Democratic primary. And uh, Washington knows Tom Perez very well. He's been a big fixer in the Democratic Party here and an administration appointee. But uh, Wes Moore, I think, is one of the rising stars of the Democratic Party if they give him a chance at trying to grab the brass ring. Jeannie, what do you think of Wes Moore? 
you know, he is such a charismatic figure. He's a young man with, with an incredible history. I know I've seen him. You interview him on your show. You know, he is a very, a, a very sort of attractive candidate. And I think that explains in part why he has been, you know, running neck and neck with these two other candidates who are, of course, more establishment and, of course, somebody in elected office. And he has the benefit of having Oprah Winfrey's, uh, you know, uh, nod there in terms of an endorsement. Um, he, you know, you look at Perez, though, he also got the endorsement of the Washington Post, the Baltimore Sun, the AFL-CIO. So, you know, it's going to be a close race. And I was just looking at the polls, and Rick and I were talking about this. Very tough to read those polls because they're all within a margin of error. And my old mantra, David, never enough polling in these state races. Yeah. So we really don't have a good sense. And I would just add that Maryland is not going to release the numbers because they're going to not start counting the mail-in ballots until Thursday. So we may not know for some time. So, so Rick, at the same time, does experience, particularly experience in government and running things, count anymore? Because Tom Paris, if he were here, he'd make the pitch, look, at I've done this. I've been effective in the government. I know how to do this. And Westmore's a really nice guy. He, he ran Robin Hood Foundation, a charity, but he's never run anything like a substantial government agency. No, he's, he's a, a, a new to politics, new to government guy. Uh, but I would say uh, it's a three-way race, and all three are about the even. And, and Peter Franchot, who's the third candidate in the race, has 22 years of experience. And you add that to, to uh, uh, Mr. Perez, and, and two-thirds of this race are going for experience. So uh, in a three-way race, you never know what's going to happen, and the outsider could win. Uh, but uh, I would say on the issue of whether or not voters like experience, uh, overwhelmingly they're siding with these other two candidates uh, in, uh, in a three-way race. Uh, Gene, let's turn for a moment to what I call Democrat on Democrat violence these days. We saw Bernie Sanders really go after Joe Manchin uh, over, over the weekend. And then we have some congressional races like the Haley Stevens versus Mr. Levin up in Michigan. We got Democrats going at each other rather than at Republicans. They are, and your home state is a great example of that. This, this Stevens-Levin battle, you have two really well-liked Democrats because of redistricting running against each other. And Haley Stevens has gotten a lot of support from the APAC, uh, from their APAC PAC group and in, in terms of millions of dollars. And you have Levin getting some support from J Street, not nearly as much in dollars, but coming out and attacking. And I, I had to notice that Steven said this is what her opponents do right before they're about to lose. So she feels, I think, pretty good about this race. But it is just another example. We have this in New York as well of Democrats, because of redistricting, being forced to run against each other and neither one of them being willing to step down as incumbents. Rick, how much was redistricting? How much is that basically uh, the Democrats are up against the wall? I mean, they, they, well, I think they, a little. Go ahead. Yeah, a little bit of a redistricting. But look, this is kind of a proxy fight, as Jeannie mentioned, between J Street and APAC. I mean, uh, left on their own, they wouldn't, uh, the two candidates wouldn't have enough money to really uh, raise this kind of uh, level of uh, heat and rhetoric. Uh, but J Street's, you know, they're for a two state solution, they side with Levin. Uh, and, uh, and APAC is opposed to that, and so they're siding with the other candidates. So um, uh, that's why we're talking about this race, because two big, muscular lobbying firms uh, are internationalizing, not nationalizing, internationalizing this campaign. It's fascinating. So, G, what are you watching right now in the midterms overall? What do you think? Are there any trends that you're detecting? Well, you know, we were just talking about this Democrat on Democrat battle, and I think that is something that I'm really curious about because we've seen this for many years. It precedes this race, but you've got a Democratic Party with a lot of the energy on the progressive side. We saw that in the 2020 presidential race. That's still the case. But you also have the Democratic Party wanting to win, and that means winning purple districts. And just to go back to Bernie Sanders this weekend, I understand he's fired up about not getting everything they want and build back better. But I wish the Democrats would take the win. If they can tell people that they've reduced the cost of pharmaceuticals and got a chip bill in the middle of the summer before a midterm election, that's not a bad thing to run on. But it's been curious because Democrats don't seem to want to take that win, which is a bit frustrating. Well, Rick, whether they want to take it or not, they've positioned in a way that it's almost impossible. It's going to feel like a loss no matter what happens. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and look, I mean, I think the Biden administration has become a victim of sort of liberal expectation setting. You know, they had all these grand plans for these big social programs, big climate programs, big tax programs. 
and and they just bit off more they can chew. And and a guy like Joe Manchin is just never going to be for most of that stuff. And and I think now there's this recognition, okay, you know, we're not going to get that agenda passed. And so there's this whole new like, oh my God, we're in tough shape in the midterms. We got to do something. And 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 I just think that this was a tough situation for the White House because those expectations set by the progressive left, they could never deliver the votes for those. Okay. I'm delighted to say Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzana are going to be staying with us as we're going to turn to our midterm report. We're going to actually turn to actually what is going on next with respect to the Democratic Party. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, one of the things that people are talking about is age these days. And it's not just President Biden. It's also Mitch McConnell's age. And it's uh, Nancy Pelosi's age. So many of our leaders are getting elderly. We have seen a report now out of a Politico saying, well, one of the things that President Biden might do to fix that problem is to endorse legalizing marijuana. For their reaction to this idea about whether President Biden should go after pot, we are joined by, once again by Rick Davis and Jeannie Shanzano, our crack political contributors. So, Jeannie, I'll start with you. Is that going to do the trick? I don't know if it will do a trick. I do think it makes sound sense, both financially and for the president, to pursue legalization of marijuana. I've long said that and long thought that. But I don't know that it's going to succeed in drumming up support amongst this important age group from 18 to 25, 18 to 29, that all of the latest polls show feel that President Biden doesn't really have the wherewithal to run again in 2024. And, of course, they're not alone. You know, I, I, my sense is if abortion wasn't going to get them over that hump, I'm not sure legalization of marijuana will. But, again, I do think it's a good policy for him to pursue. So, Rick Davis, how do you handle this? I mean, we, uh, some of us are old enough to remember when Ronald Reagan famously said in that debate about Walter Mondale, we won't hold your youthful inexperience against you when they were making an issue of his age. But is this a real issue for voters, how old the candidate is? Yeah, I think it's actually much more important to young voters than uh, an issue like pot legalization, where in half the states they can go buy it for recreational use anyway. Uh, the reality is that uh, young people like to vote for young people. Uh, you know, Bill Clinton, 40 years old, uh, Barack Obama in his 40s, when they were elected, they had the majority of the youth vote. Uh, there's not much for young people to choose from right now. I mean, when most of your top leaders are geriatrics in Washington these days, uh, uh, you got to wonder what they're seeing in this New York Times poll. Was it over 94 percent, 96 percent said they would not over uh, 18 to 24 would not support uh, Joe Biden's second run for office. So uh, it's a real problem for Democrats, but it's a real problem for Republicans, too. If we put up a geriatric candidate uh, next time around, we can't expect young voters to see somebody that they uh, believe are in touch with their values. Is Donald Trump geriatric, Rick? Yes, Donald <laughs> Trump is a geriatric. and <laughs> I think certainly he would be by the time the campaign starts. Uh, I mean, when you have a bunch of 80-year-olds running for office, it's 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 going to dis you know you're going to take the young people out of the equation. They won't have much to choose from, and then they'll go to the issues like Jeannie was talking about. Uh, there's no question they've had a profound impact on things like gay marriage and, uh, as Jeannie said, abortion and 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 certainly these state issues with cannabis legalization. Uh, you know, young people have voted overwhelmingly for it. So it's not that they don't have an impact on policy at all, but I think what they're looking for is something somebody uh, for a national office who actually reflects their hopes and dreams and aspirations better than a bunch of 80-year-olds. So, Jeannie, you're a political scientist. You've studied the history of this. How does this work for the Democratic Party when you have a sitting president in the Oval Office? There is open talk about people that I know, at least, saying somebody should go into the Oval Office and say, you know what, Mr. President, you shouldn't run again. Rick mentioned the polling we saw out of the New York Times. How does that process happen, or does it happen? 
You know, I, I'm sure that he is well aware of all the talk. I think it's very tough to approach a president and have that conversation unless you are very close to the president. I'm sure it is being had in those circles. But the reality for Democrats is they don't feel like there is a bench there. People cannot coalesce or think about who might come after Biden. And I would just say this is a problem not just for us in the United States. Look at England, the, the, the age of the next king of England. Look at Italy, where young people simply are not not in the mix in terms of politics. So it's really an international phenomenon we're seeing. Leaders have an obligation to develop their successors. And it has been a real problem for the Democratic Party. Look at the president. You're talking about that. Look at the House leadership. I have to say Republican leaders in the House have done much better in this regard. But Nancy Pelosi's age alone is another indication. So we've got to do better on developing people to come after our current leaders. Okay. Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano of Iona College, thank you so much for being with us. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg.